Hi, when we are doing the workup of an infertile couple, in the outpatient department we do a lot of tests. But yes, there is a time when we have to move on and do the advanced tests in a man which could be doing his uh, sperm function tests apart from the basic semen analysis and in a woman it could be to do the assessment of the fallopian tubes which can be done by doing a hysterosalpingraphy or a sonosalpingraphy. But I always tell you that these are basically preliminary or even primitive tests because they only tell you the tubal patency, they never tell you beyond the uterine cavity, anything else like the relations of the tube with the bowel, if there are any additions, if the tubo ovarian relation is maintained or if there are any other pathologies which are on the surface of the tubes. So yes, I always say the best way to assess the fallopian tubes and the pelvic anatomy in an infertile woman is to do a laparohistroscopy, which is what we are going to see in this video. This was shot in my OT some 15 days back when I was operating on this woman who was infertile for around 7-8 years and she had all these basic tests, the histosalpingraphy and the basic treatment of giving ovulation induction, many things like that, but she was not conceiving. So I did this laparohistroscopy along with my fellows of uh, reproductive medicine and some postgraduates who attended this from the department of gynecology. So when we are doing this uh, uh, laparohistroscopy, the first thing is to enter the abdomen and make a pneumoperitoneum or putting in some carbon dioxide to distend the abdomen. So distension of the abdomen is done by carbon dioxide and the entry into that abdomen is done by the virus needle. Now see if you can uh, note that I am holding the virus needle in a dart holding fashion because if I hold like this, then the spring action of virus needle will happen when I am going through the abdominal wall. Let me explain. This virus needle has two parts, an outer sharp beveled end and an inner blunt stilet. So when I am going through the abdomen, the blunt stilet gets retracted and the sharp bevel will go through the abdomen. But when you are through the abdomen, then the blunt bevel will come back and it will protect any further injury of uh, organs like the bowel or mesentery blood vessels. So once you are in the abdomen, we make sure that we are in the abdomen and the best way to make sure that you are in the abdomen is to look at the pressure gauge, the manometer which tells us that the pressure should be around 8 to 10 millimeters of mercury. Now these are not the working pressures, these are the pressures in the abdomen when we are trying to put the virus needle and it makes sure that the needle is in a place where there is no obstruction. So the pressure of 8 to 10 millimeters of mercury tells us that the air is flowing freely through the virus needle. If there is a block, then the pressure will go up to 20, 30, 40 and you know that there is an obstruction. So that is one best uh, assessment which I always use. All right. Once you are inside the abdomen, then you start uh, insufflating carbon dioxide. That is what we are doing now and that is to distend the abdomen by 2.5 to 3 liters of carbon dioxide and uh, we can assess that by tapping the abdomen and that will tell us that there is some loss of the uh, liver dullness and there will be some tympanic sounds when we are tapping on the abdomen. At the same time, we are also cleaning and doing a white balance. See, that's what I was doing here on the scope. There is this white gauze piece which is at the scope and I am doing a white balance. Now, what's a white balance? I am trying to arrange the optics in a way that whatever I see in the abdomen is on a white background. So, that is a white balance of the camera which I am using along with this laparoscope. So once I have done that and I have uh, uh, used the time to insufflate the abdomen, next is to put a trocar and cannula. Now trocar and cannula, see I am holding in a different way than the virus needle. I am holding it with the palm of my hand. I will try to show you. Now this is the trocar cannula and I am holding the trocar with my fingers but the back of the trocar is having a resistance with the palm of my hand. Why? Because now this has a movable two parts also and I don't want the trocar to withdraw when I am going through the tough abdominal wall. So that's why when I hold this trocar and cannula, it's in this fashion and I push this trocar and cannula in a corkscrew manner, alright. Now this is different from a virus needle because virus needle is held in a dart holding fashion because I want this spring action to continue happening in the virus needle whereas in a trocar cannula, I want to make sure that this trocar does not get retracted when I am trying to push this cannula into the abdomen. So this is what is depicted here in the next part of the video that I am entering the abdomen with a corkscrew fashion. And uh, once I am in the abdomen, I am very sure that I am in the abdomen because I can see that some air will be hissing out from the 
open valve of the cannula. So I'm very sure that I'm in a place where they have, I have injected some air. So next is that I enter the abdomen with the scope, which has been white balanced already. And moment I enter the abdomen, this patient, if you can see, there are a whole lot of additions in this patient. If you see the, um, the whole uh, uterus is covered with the omental additions and the omental additions to the left side of the abdomen and uh, in the uh, bladder also there is some addition which is not shown in this particular picture. So I now know that uh, I'm going to be having a problem of doing a lot of edicialysis in a patient which I was just planning to do a diagnostic laparoscopy. So what was planned as a diagnostoscopy now became an operative scopy. So here I'm putting another port so that I can use my scissors and my uh, graspers to make sure that the edicialysis is easier. So now this three port operative laparoscopy, I'm doing a painstaking long edicialysis just to make sure that I can see the uterus properly and the tubal anatomy. So here I'm taking out the omental additions uh, with the monopolar cauteries and scissors which are here with me. And uh, once we do the edicialysis, it's only then that you can assess the tubal anatomy in this place. Now you try and understand that if there are so many additions, then the tubal function, the tubal motility, that itself is compromised. That's why this woman won't be conceiving in spite of the best ovulation induction regimes and the intrauterine inseminations which you do. Now the HSG of the same case. This uterus came out with a perfect anatomy and you can see the fallopian tubes are also patent. The left one and the right one, both the tubes are nicely patent. So when you see this, you feel that the fallopian tubes are patent. You can go ahead and give the treatment of doing intrauterine insemination or even try to give them ovulation induction and timed intercourse as a management. But yes, this is what is wrong in practice sometimes because the tube may look patent, but it is not having a complete assessment. The HSG is not giving us the complete assessment where the tube is free. I want the tube to have that peristaltic motion to happen. And if this tube is stuck in additions, like in the patient which I was showing you, that peristaltic movement, which is very vital for the movement of the oocyte towards the uterine cavity and the movement of the embryo once the oocyte is fertilized in the ampulla towards the uterine cavity, that motion won't happen if the tube is stuck in additions. And that's what happened in the patient which I was operating, the one which I'm showing you now. See, finally, I have got the right fallopian tube uh, free of adhesions. This I'm taking out the adhesions of the right fallopian tube from the posterior uterine surface and the right ovarian surface. And now the fallopian tube is free. Now, after getting the fallopian tube free, what I saw next was that both the ovaries were attached deep into the pelvis and to the posterior uterine surface. But once I removed the adhesions of the right ovary from the posterior uterine surface, I saw that there was a small undiagnosed dermoid cyst in this patient. So yes, the next thing I did was removal of a dermoid cyst. I'll show that to you some in some other video. But right now you can see that there are some there are some fat particles all over the uterus and over the uh, bowel surface and you can see some hair also, isn't it? Because the dermoid cyst was so badly stuck that it got ruptured and I had to clear up a whole lot of muck. And finally, I got this pelvis free of all the adhesions and then I did the chromotivation. Somebody is injecting the methylene blue dye and you saw it coming from the left tube first. And then uh, I was hoping that the right tube is also patent. So I asked my resident to push in some more pressure while doing this, uh, you know, chromotivation. And then I saw some dye coming out from the right tube as well. And this is one of the most reassuring sites when you have such a bad abdominal uh, adhesion in a patient with the infertility and you now find that the pelvis is cleared and uh, both the tubes are patent. So after the assessment of the abdomen, after doing this extensive edicylysis and removal of the dermoid and the chromotivation, now we have to do the hysteroscopy. Now, before I show you the hysteroscopy of this patient, let me tell you some basics that if this is the hysteroscope, yes, this is the hysteroscope and there's a four millimeter scope. So when this hysteroscope is put into the uterus like this, you will not be able to see anything till you distend the uterus. So distension of the uterus is done by saline or by glycine. We have done that discussions in uh, the app already. So when you distend the uterus and put in bright light, then only you can see around the uterine cavity. Now remember one thing, you see the endocervix first, then the cavity, and now you have to see the osteas, the right ostea and the left ostea, if the ostea are having any fibrosis and if they are patent from inside. So how do you see the ostea? Now please, one thing which you don't have to do 
is don't move this scope like this to see around the uterus because when you do that you're going to bend the scope and you're going to spoil the scope and the life of scopes is very important because these instruments are extremely expensive so yes when you're inside the uterus you will not move the scope like this but you will turn it you will turn it can you see my hand i'm turning the scope i'll tell you why because the end of most of hysteroscopes has an angle at the end you see the angle of this scope is the lens is at an angle of 30 degrees so when i am keeping the scope like this i am able to see the right ostia and now i will turn the scope and i will be able to see the left ostia so yes by turning the scope right and left ostia is seen by turning the scope and not moving the scope so when i see the ostia then i withdraw my scope and then the hysteroscope is complete but yes that what is a plan for a normal uterus look what happened in this patient who was infertile for eight years in this patient moment i entered i saw this polyp and then behind the polyp i saw a fibroid so a small fibroid of around 1.5 centimeters and a polyp see this both of them are here undiagnosed lying in this uterus so when we did this hysteroscopy we had two things removed after the diagnosis so once I'm here inside, I'm going towards the right side. Here I see the right ostia. It's looking good. And uh, now I turn the scope, not move the scope. And now I see the left ostia. And once I've seen the ostia, then of course I withdraw the scope and put my operating channel to start doing the removal of the fibroid and of the polyp. So this is a demonstration of exactly what I always keep saying in my classes when I take an infertility class and also to my postgraduates who keep coming for the uh, training in reproductive medicine that the best assessment is done by a laparoscopy and a hysteroscopy. This patient, six, seven years of treatment and now finally the laparoscopy and the hysteroscopy showed that there were some undiagnosed things like severe adhesions, a dermoid cyst and a polyp in the uterine cavity and a fibroid. Each one of them individually can contribute to infertility. So that's why laparoscopy and a hysteroscopy both done in the same sitting is the best assessment of the anatomy of a woman who is infertile. All right. So yes, I hope I have conveyed my point convincingly to you people with the surgery which we did recently. All right. Thank you so much.